Hello, I'm Roger Chen, and I'm here today to tell you about fluorescent proteins, uh, which have made a major impact on microscopy because they are genetically encodable and provide a relatively direct link from molecular and cell biology into colors that we can directly see, uh, particularly in the light microscope, but also, uh, as you will see later on, in more macroscopic levels, uh, as well as eventually now uh, beginning to help us with uh, hyper super resolution. So uh, here, this picture is, of course, of the jellyfish, and this jellyfish is where it all began. And in a way, this is the, the creature that we most have to thank. This is the jellyfish Equoria victoria, uh, which uh, was uh, studied in uh, Puget Sound by uh, Professor Shimamura, and a moment, a little bit more about him soon. Uh, this is a source of two of the most actually valuable proteins in cell biology. Uh, first, there's the protein that actually enables this jellyfish to glow and that's called the corin. Uh, and uh, the, when the jellyfish is alarmed in the water and the water is disturbed, it, it emits a glow. And then the partner of the corin is the green fluorescent protein, which changes the color from blue to green. To this day, we really don't have a uh, well-accepted explanation as to why the jellyfish wants to glow. Uh, why should it... Mm, and show this remarkable phenomenon uh, when the water is disturbed, uh, nor do we know why when the, um, the jellyfish glows, why was it so important that it glow green instead of blue? Um, why not just leave the corn? Or if it really was important to glow green, why not just change the corn in the first place to make it glow green directly rather than invent an additional protein? But we're very grateful to the jellyfish for having um, invented GFP. So uh, the uh, example, this is perhaps one of the only uh, um, videos that we know of where we can show you the, the, the glow of the, of the jellyfish. And uh, this uh, is a jellyfish upside down in a beaker uh, in, uh, in an aquarium at Alaska where the jellyfish can still be found. And there's actually, uh, we are illuminating with ultraviolet light right now. And you may be able to see that there's a circle here of, of uh, uh, that is uh, got little, little dots around the edge. That is the jellyfish glowing. And this is the green fluorescent protein naturally made by the jellyfish that we are exciting with the UV lamp. I'm sorry the beaker is a bit fluorescent. It, we should have got a better beaker that didn't have any, but there's some yellow background. But nevertheless, uh, uh, you can see the jellyfish there. And it's upside down and confined in this little beaker. And what we're going to do in a moment is poke it uh, to uh, stimulate the flash. So we're going to start here. And and uh, you may be able to see that the jellyfish is slightly moving around. Uh, in this video, we are playing with the illumination, trying to get it you know, nicely uh, uh, aimed at the jellyfish. And in a moment, we're going to bring in this rod uh, with which we're going to poke it. Then we turn out the lights, and we stir. And during that stirring, that was the light of, emitted by the jellyfish, uh, not the, the lights that previously had been applied from our uh, UV lamp. Uh, so that's it. That's the flesh. And maybe you might have been able to see that it was sort of greenish, maybe. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, the a man who discovered that phenomenon is shown here. Uh, this is Osamu Shimomura. Uh, and in 1962, uh, he published his papers on, first paper on Ikorin. And that was really the protein that he was most interested in. It had the really exciting job of turning chemical energy into light. And he also mentioned that he found this contaminant that got in the way a little bit of the purification and that it was a greenish protein that fluoresced green and that uh, later he mentioned that it changed the color uh, of the uh, acorin from the color of the jellyfish, excuse me, from the blue of acorin to the green uh, of GFP. Uh, later in 1979, he actually proposed the structure of the chromophore of GFP based on surprisingly little evidence, but he got it almost absolutely completely correct with only very, very small uh, uh, modifications that later work that came in. This is a picture of him much later uh, in 2008 uh, in the rehearsal for the Nobel ceremony, and he is actually holding a UV lamp. That's the violet uh, that's on your left, and then next to it is the tube of of GFP, and this is perhaps the last tube in existence that was actually made from real jellyfish that he had kept in his freezer uh, all this time. Since then, everything has been made by molecular biology, and that's due to the, this man here, Douglas Prasher, in the center of the photograph, who in 1992 published the cloning of the gene for GFP. 
and uh, uh, that was a long struggle. Uh, he didn't know what to look for, and he uh, could not predict that it would become green fluorescent. In fact, that was a major worry that uh, there was no precedent for a protein that made by a biological organism would absorb blue light and turn and fluoresce green. Uh, without the benefit, we didn't know whether it needed any cofactors. Normally, in many cases, when biology does this sort of remarkable thing uh, with light, it uses small molecule cofactors. You're seeing me, for example, not because your, the proteins in your eye directly absorb the light through the protein, but rather because the proteins bind retinal, the pigment that we have to get from other sources, and that binds into the, chromo into the protein to make the functional protein. And for all we knew, uh, the fear was that maybe this uh, uh, protein used another cofactor, or that the chromophore structure that uh, um, uh, Shimamura had proposed might take many enzymes to generate out of the protein. But, uh, Marty Chalfi, who's shown here on the right side of the picture, uh, uh, then got the clone from uh, uh, the gene from uh, Prasher, uh, as I did as well. But uh, 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 Marty was first and proved that just that gene alone was self-sufficient. In other words, if you took that gene and expressed it in other organisms, and he did it in E. coli and in worms, uh, then you would generate fluorescence. And that proved that GFP was self-sufficient. It knew how to make its own chromophore out of its own guts. Um, Fred Tsuji, not shown here, uh, also did uh, in very, very soon after uh, Chalfi independently. So uh, we now know that the chromophore structure uh, is uh, something like this structure here at the right, but it had to come from the protein uh, structure that was thrown here where it's just at this stage still amino acids. And there's a serine, a tyrosine, and a glycine that somehow have to be modified and we have to introduce uh, through a various number of steps which people are still now somewhat de debating exactly how it happens. We generate an extra double bond, we generate a ring and so on and all of this does require oxygen. If you do not have oxygen in the atmosphere when this protein is growing it cannot become fluorescent or uh, doesn't even absorb light let alone become fluorescent. Uh, so uh, the uh, oxygen is essential and the only creatures which are biologically incapable of using GFP, assuming we can get the DNA, the gene for, DNA, uh, for GFP in, would be organisms that cannot tolerate oxygen at any stage in their life cycle. In other words, obligate anaerobes, but they are a limitation. We do need oxygen. Uh, so then, uh, it, this may seem to be a, a completely unprecedented reaction, but it turns out that the crucial first step is the attack of a backbone NH from glycine 67 onto the amide bond uh, of uh, serine 65. And this is a very strange reaction, you might think. I mean, since when does one amide attack another? Uh, but in fact, it turns out to be fairly similar to a known uh, reaction in biochemistry where the side chain amide of asparagine uh, attacks, uh, the side chain, uh, excuse me, of glycine attacks the side, ch the side chain amide of asparagine. And uh, that uh, is promoted by bringing them closely into a chain and it requires the special properties of glycine uh, that it can curl up and also that it's relatively unencumbered in its uh, NH group. And it's interesting that of all all the fluorescent proteins that have ever been discovered, the most conserved residue is not the one that contributes the most atoms to the chromophore, nor this other one that gets attacked, but rather glycine 67. Every known fluorescent protein has glycine 67 in it. Uh, and maybe it's because that's necessary for that first step. Later on, the, the, uh, print, the, um, the asparagine glycine goes into a different path. It also forms a ring, but it splits out ammonia or, and so on, uh, and they, they, are, they diverge. Now, there's one important other feature about this chemistry that I have to mention. Oxygen comes in and at some stage pulls off the hydrogens that are uh, separating, that were on the tyrosine. Uh, and connecting the, the, um, the, the beta um, carbons, of, uh, the beta hydrogens of the tyrosine that connect it to the rest of the chromophore. So O2 pulls off H2 and the product is hydrogen peroxide. H2 plus O2 does not give you water in this case. You have to balance the number of hydrogens and oxygens. H2 plus O2 gives you 
H2O2, which is hydrogen peroxide. So there is one molecule of a toxic, slightly toxic substance that's generated for every molecule of GFP. And that's sort of required by the conservation of mass. It has been now directly verified. And it is a potential problem that GFP is not totally, totally safe for the organism. And making a heck of a lot of GFP could generate one mole of hydrogen peroxide per every mole of GFP you make. And you have to keep that in mind. Now, fortunately, most organisms that have grown up in air have some defense against the slow bit of hydrogen peroxide that's trickling out. And we seem to be OK. But it's something that you have to keep in mind. I should also say that in this original scheme, we proposed that dehydration went before oxidation. And actually, that's not quite so clear at exactly which stage to oxygen uh, comes in and makes hydrogen peroxide maybe a little bit earlier um, than I drew here. So the original jellyfish protein actually was not very strongly fluorescent. Uh, this dotted line here is the spectrum of the wild type GFP, and it has a big X, uh, 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 peak around 400 nanometers, just below 400 nanometers. In other words, the jellyfish actually, GFP, actually glows best in the UV. And it only has a minor peak out here in the sort of green that gave it its name, and that's the one everyone wants to use. Uh, why the jellyfish deliberately crippled this protein so that actually five-sixths of the time, roughly, it is generating the U, uh, UV and only one-sixth of the time the visible, we really don't know. Nevertheless, uh, mutagenesis uh, uh, soon showed that as particularly mutations at serine 65, which you might think wasn't that close to the chromophore, though it contributed some of the atoms, turned out to clean up the spectrum enormously and get rid of this UV peak and accentuate the visible peak and also make the protein more stable. And so these are the ones, the descendants of these um, improved proteins are the ones that everyone uses nowadays, including the very popular and so-called EGFP, E standing for enhanced, which was uh, this uh, mutation S65T plus a folding mutation to make it fold a little bit better. Another feature I should say is that the jellyfish originally grew in Puget, it lived in, lives in Puget sound or very cold water, it never had any reason to worry about ability to fold at warm temperatures. But so many of us want to work on mammalian tissue at 37 degrees. This gel original protein just sort of collapsed and basically wouldn't fold efficiently. And a lot of mutagenesis, of which this was only just the beginning, then uh, gradually made the protein able to tolerate warmer temperatures and fold more efficiently. So uh, later on, uh, the crystal structure appeared almost simultaneously from two groups in 1996. Uh, one of them was of this mutant S65T, and it showed uh, a beautiful 11-stranded beta barrel. So the GFP is almost a perfect cylinder made out of these strands that uh, cross in this sort of helical lattice around the outside. And then up the middle is an alpha helix that carries the chromophore. And the chromophore in this model here is the, atom, uh, the, the bit in the middle that has the red and blue atoms that are, uh, show up in atomic level, whereas everything else is just uh, beta strands or alpha helix. Uh, and uh, this uh, revealed why, in a way, no other enzymes were necessary. They couldn't have been necessary because the chromophore is completely deeply buried inside the cylinder. So nothing else could have ever gotten at it. So it was essential, in a way, that the protein learned to do surgery on its own guts and thereby uh, generate the chromophore in that chemistry I was just discussing where the hydrogen oxygen somehow has to get in, hydrogen peroxide gets out. Uh, simultaneously, the other structure, which was more of the original wild-type GFP, happened to be in a different crystal form and showed that the GFP was also dimeric. And uh, that's another form of GFP. And actually, there's an equilibrium between the two. Uh, and uh, it turns out that the GFP has a hydrophobic patch where these amino acids mentioned here uh, uh, from the two Three of them from each of the subunits uh, get together, and this greasy patch uh, enables dimerization. And this is something to keep in mind. Again, one of the slight problems with wild-type GFP is that it likes a little bit to dimerize. And dimerization is generally bad when we want to tag a particular protein, because that forces the protein that we're really interested in, the partner, 
to also become dimeric when it wouldn't otherwise have been. We have forced it to be dimeric by fusing it to GFP. And um, that often changes the cell biology and messes things up. It doesn't matter so much if you're just trying to light up a cell and you're using isolated protein because then the fact that it wants to be a dimer, if it's not stuck to anything, it, nobody, and nobody else cares, so to speak. Nevertheless, uh, there's been a lot of interest and, uh, in the dimerization and we now know exactly how to get rid of it. For example, if you take uh, the alanine 206, which is one of the ones mentioned, and change it to a lysine, A206K completely destroys the dimerization because then a lysine and a lysine replacing the alanine and alanine are now in each other's face and the electrostatic repulsion between the two plus charges blows apart this dimer interface and we suppress the dimerization. So in any time that you're in any concern about it, there are mutations that can be used to fix the dimerization problem and they don't seem to have any bad effects on any of the other properties of GFP. So can we get other colors? And there, we, there was a lot of interest in getting other colors for ma various reasons. The very simplest is that sometimes we want to follow several different proteins simultaneously or follow different cells which are marked with different, and by making them different colors, we can distinguish uh, all of these. So uh, uh, the original color is pretty close to this. The green output, uh, if, the, if you forget the UV that the wild type produced, that you wouldn't have seen it with your eyes anyway. The residual green is very similar to this green from S65T, except that S65T puts all of its energy into this green instead of uh, only one-sixth of it. Uh, it turns out to be possible to make uh, a blue, a cyan, and even a somewhat yellowish version, it's not awfully yellow, it's a yellowish green still, but we did call it YFP. And these were found by various substitutions of the chromophore or around the chromophore. So for example, if you change the original uh, tyrosine uh, in the chromophore, which is here, uh, and change it to a histidine, then we get the blue. If we change it to a tryptophan, we get the cyan. And uh, by the way, the, two UV, the UV peak was when this tyrosine was neutral, and the green peak is when the tyrosine is uh, negatively charged. Uh, and this turns out to be crucial for my next lecture, where we often, people often now play with this equilibrium and make it sub subject to environmental influences. And by changing the ratio, basically, of the UV to the visible peak, we can make a GFP that switches on uh, due to environmental influences. And finally, the yellowish version is by taking an amino acid that's remote in the primary sequence, that's tyrosine, uh, the threonine, excuse me, 203, changing it to things like tyrosine or phenylalanine, and thereby it's close in three-dimensional space. It stacks above the real chromophore, and the pi pi stacking is what we believe is responsible for the yellow shift uh, that makes it a wide, somewhat yellowish green. If we now look at the uh, a range of fluorescent proteins, up to now everything was uh, based on GFP from the jellyfish with mutational engineering. But it turns out that fluorescent proteins are fairly widely distributed in nature. In fact, there are homologs in vertebrates, though they happen not to be fluorescent. Have, if they were, we'd all be walking around like sort of uh, uh, the green giant. Uh, but in fact, uh, the ones that are, all that are fluorescent are all come from the phylum Cnidaria, uh, which is the glorified Latin name for basically the family of Cylenterates that includes jellyfish and corals and some other related organisms. And it's not just the jellyfish that can make fluorescence, but it turns out the corals. And that was the brilliant discovery of a Russian group, uh, headed uh, first author Mats et al. And they have subsequently done a lot of the phylogenetic tree uh, by doing this cl the classic molecular evolutional uh, and genome analyses. So uh, a lot of you know, of course, tropical corals have beautiful colors. Every uh, scuba diver knows that, or even a snorkeler. But what we didn't realize is that so many of those colors are actually due to homologs of GFP. And uh, particularly uh, one that was attracted a lot of interest and was the subject of that first paper by the uh, Matsuda was Discosoma, which uh, has a beautiful red fluorescence. And uh, the, that paper was about the cloning of the gene for a red fluorescent protein that they called DS for Discosoma, DS red. Uh, and uh, uh, it proved to be this beautiful red color. At that time, it was not clear right away how 
did the jelly, uh, the corals manage to co coerce the chromophore into uh, absorbing green light now instead of blue and fluorescing red instead of green. Uh, but uh, a, a chemical analysis of the chromophore eventually showed that what the corals had figured out how to do was add an extra double bond, which is between uh, uh, the uh, uh, carbon in this place and the nitrogen here and this forms a very unusual structure called an acylimine that is basically completely unstable in ordinary solution and is only held together by virtue of being inside the protein but that extra double bond here in addition to all the double bonds that were up here now extends the chromophore and it, it, it recruits this ketone or a carbonyl group that used to be part of the amide and this extended chromophore then turns out to beautifully explain the red color as even shown by quantum mechanical calculations. And uh, when um, this structure was determined, uh, uh, some people in my lab were really pleased with themselves and they used the actual bacteria expressing the uh, protein and used it as ink and with little toothpicks they drew the structure on a petri dish so you can both see the beautiful red color and the, the uh, structure that gives rise to it all in one picture. Now, DS red made by the corals, as typical, was made by the coral for its own reasons. And to this day, as usual, we really don't have a definitive explanation that everyone accepts for why the corals should want to have these colors. Uh, and, but whatever it is, the protein was not ideal for cell biological use. The biggest problem was that it turned out to be a very tight, obligate tetramer. A GFP was a weak dimer, and even the weak dimerization occasionally gave problem, but DS red being a tight tetramer uh, often prevents proper trafficking of fusions. It's even worse because it's really strong and uh, uh, tight, and uh, four copies of your protein that you're trying to label red now get uh, fused together. And an example here was uh, on connexin 43, which is a constituent of gap junctions and its detailed structures and shown here. If you fuse it to GFP, you can get a fluorescent gap junction and it traffics reasonably well and makes this fluorescent plaque. In a, a mi uh, this is a micrograph, of course, showing that there's a boundary between one cell and another, which is slightly fluorescent. But when you do the same with DS red, uh, the plaque, of course, is trying to make a it's, this connexin 43 wants to make a hexamer on its own. Two of them eventually get together into a 12-mer, a dodecamer. Meanwhile, the connexin 43 is trying to make a tetramer. The two clash with each other, and you get a mess, and the protein never can make a gap junction. Uh, there was additional problems like the DS red took really a long time to turn red and it didn't finish the job. It left some green behind. But the fact that it went through a green stage is an interesting clue. Eventually these were all fixed by mutagenesis. Uh, it was much more difficult than with GFP uh, because that tetramer was really hard to break. But eventually now we now have a whole gamut of different colors of uh, fluorescent proteins derived from DS red through monomeric forms and it turned out to be not too hard to change their color. So over here are the four that came from the jellyfish, blue, cyan, green, and yellow. And these are all, by the way, these are all little tubes of that protein made in E. coli and purified and simply uh, photographed um, by their own fluorescent light. And then we eventually got these additional colors, uh, at least in my lab, and uh, uh, in order to separate them and keep them uh, well, easy to remember, we gave them the names of fruits and in which each color, ref like this one is honeydew because honeydews are sort of yellowish green and then there's a, uh, a tangerine and strawberry and cherry and so on, all these different beautiful red colors. The one exception that isn't really monomeric is so-called tandem dimer tomato and uh, that is actually two copies of the original 11-stranded beta barrel that are permanently genetically fused to each other. And in that way, they satisfy each other. This protein is not a tetramer anymore. It's a dimer, but it's internally satisfied. It's got two copies. Uh, and when you fuse it, you fuse both together as one unit. And uh, that's why we call it a tandem dimer. So uh, I wanted to mention then that derived from these uh, new coral proteins, there have been, and actually there are some varieties that were made from the original jellyfish as well. It now turns out that there are uh, proteins that can be deliberately changed with light. Uh, of course, some proteins bleach, 
and that can be very useful in techniques like photofluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. But uh, uh, an even more spectacular case is this uh, protein called dendra, which uh, starts out green, like DS red, but whereas DS red spontaneously changes from green to red, this one sits green indefinitely until you shine blue light on it, blue light on it, and that is what switches it from green to red. So we can use this as sort of an optical highlighter to, for example, in this case, uh, track the migration of a protein called fibrillarin. These authors uh, fused the dendra to fibrillarin and locally uh, turned, shined blue light on, turned some of it from green to red, and then watched the subsequent fate of just those proteins that had been labeled. So those proteins that were in the spot first lost their uh, green color, not quite completely. It might have been better if it had been complete, but they lost it considerably. And then there's some recovery as proteins move around into this illuminated zone. And meanwhile, the red protein made in the spot uh, then over time spreads out and we can watch. These are f one, two, three, four, are four different regions of interest in the original uh, that were being tracked. An even more spectacular form of photochemistry is shown by DROMPA, which is reversible. And uh, it starts out green fluorescent. And as you continue to excite its green fluorescence using uh, blue-green light, it fades away and bleaches essentially down to nothing. Uh, and you might think that this protein is dead. And with most fluorescent proteins, had you done it, you'd be right. But this one, when you shine violet light on it, springs back to life and comes back fully, um, completely just about uh, uh, rejuvenated. And we can do this cycle after cycle after cycle. And as shown here, these are uh, uh, compression, uh, time, per compressed time course of probably 50 cycles and it can just, there's a slight bit of rundown as you go through many, many, many cycles, but you can do this over and over again. And uh, the applications for repetitively following um, movements inside cells, or as you will later hear from other people for doing super resolution microscopy, there are major implications that have been uh, exploited, but I don't have time to go into them here. But the authors were so pleased with themselves that they simply laid down a film of protein, uh, a wet film of protein and then they shined its own name successively using this trick of uh, bleaching it, starting a fluorescent, bleaching it completely, shining the letter D, a silhouette of the letter D, onto this film of protein, and then they lit up the letter D, and then they erased it again, and then they wrote it again, this time the letter R, etc., and wrote out its name. Okay. So uh, I don't have time to talk more about these uh, uh, very interesting photochemically active proteins. Uh, I'm now going to turn briefly to the question of how do we look inside a more intact animal, especially animals that are not quite as transparent as the ideals. Now, the ideals may be zebrafish, and a lot of microscopists like zebrafish or C. elegans because they're transparent, but uh, many of the other important ones, like mice or flies, uh, are somewhat more opaque. And in general, uh, most organisms, um, especially mammals, uh, are nearly completely opaque down at short wavelengths. Uh, below 600 nanometers, and that's because of the peaks of hemoglobin. After all, that's what makes us pink, uh, and why flesh is red, uh, and uh, as long as it's there, uh, you can't easily excite through very much thickness of this tissue. Uh, a standard demonstration is that if I try to shine a green laser through my, even the thinnest of my fingers, nothing will get through, but if I shine a red laser, laser pointer, a lot will get through, and that's because you, a red laser is about 630 nanometers beyond the shoulder. So it would be really nice if we had fluorescent proteins that could be both excited and would emit longer than 600 nanometers. Uh, and the record for current proteins derived from the jellyfish coral cnidarian family is just barely over 600 nanometers, and it's sort of marginal. Uh, but we'd like to get out, say, to the 700 or so. And it turns out that this is possible, but you have to be willing to go to a whole new protein family. And this protein family is now back to cofactors. These are small organic molecules. This is what we were afraid the jellyfish and corals were using. Now we actually use them, and these pigments are derived from the heme 
biosynthesis pathway. Uh, particularly, this is heme with a, porf, four porf, uh, a porphyrin, which is four paroles uh, in, a, uh, uh, in a, a big circle, uh, and with an iron in the middle. And when we break down heme or any organism that uh, uses heme, and that's essentially the entire uh, kingdom of life, uh, almost, uh, when we break it down with an enzyme called heme oxygenase, the first breakdown product is called biliverdin. Biliverdin is something that every adult human being makes about a quarter gram of every day. Uh, normally it's sort of kept uh, sequestered, but if any of you have had a big bruise and you turn sort of, quote, black and blue, a lot of that color is the broken down heme that makes biliverdin and later on bilirubin here, uh, which is uh, part of what gets excreted. So it turns out that uh, weak uh, biliverdin is uh, phylogenetically ubiquitous. Some organisms uh, elaborate it into known fluorescent pigments that have uh, these more elaborate cofactors, but it turns out that bacteria uh, use biliverdin in proteins that sense light, and by mutagenesis it was possible to prevent them from sensing light and instead use the energy to fluoresce. And uh, these now make infrared fluorescent proteins that absorb at 680 some nanometers and emit just over 700 nanometers, hence their name as infrared fluorescent proteins. And uh, they are genetically encodable. You have to make sure that the organism either provides and biliverdin or the cell provides biliverdin, and um, as I said, most of our cells make it. If necessary, you can supply a bit extra uh, by, by injection uh, if, if you don't think they make enough of their own. Uh, and so up to now, this has been the only way to decisively get beyond 600 nanometers. And an example of its use here is uh, when uh, this was transfected into the liver. Now we can see the liver through the skin of an intact mouse far, far better than even a relatively redshifted protein that was derived from corals. And in turn, that is even better than GFP, which is essentially hopeless. You cannot see the liver of a of a correspondingly trans GFP transfected mouse that's got that. Instead, all you see is the autofluorescence of the fur around the outside, whereas this stuff is shining through the uh, abdominal cavity. And there's many things more that need to be done to improve this relatively recent work. Uh, there's actually thousands of phytochromes. This is an extremely widely uh, diversified gene family. There may be possible to get even longer than I just described, uh, and it should be helpful for lots of in interesting in vivo macroscopic fluorescence imaging, uh, somewhat similar to the uh, microscopy, but uh, at a more less spatial resolution but greater depth inside intact animals. Uh, it provides colors that are orthogonal to even to the wide range we've already got. It could be an acceptor for fluorescence resonance energy transfer if its quantum yield was improved a bit more. Uh, it may be also good for uh, um, the uh, 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 photoacoustic type of imaging and many other tricks. And finally, if we, heme oxygenase activity is itself biologically important in a lot of m metabolic activities. It's responsible for making carbon monoxide and helps make cyclic GMP. And this is a possible way that we could detect that activity in a cell that doesn't have much of its own and doesn't have any other source of, of biliverdin. So uh, in conclusion, these are some of the people in my lab who contributed or that, are, that we collaborated with who contributed most to it. And once again, I'm showing you the fun uh, that you can have with these multicolored living inks made out of uh, fluorescent proteins in which uh, uh, some people in my lab with more artistic talent than I did actually tried to draw a sunset with a green flash as you might see it from the beach uh, um, uh, not far from our lab. Thank you very much.